Okay, one, two, three, test. All right, I think we're good to go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jihad Abu Salim, the Executive Director of the Jerusalem Fund. Welcome to this year's Memorial Lecture, uh, Sharif Bassiouni Memorial Lecture at the Palestine Center, the educational program of the Jerusalem Fund. The Jerusalem Fund is an independent nonprofit based here in Washington, DC, been around since the 70s. It aims to foster greater awareness about Palestine, the Palestinian experience, and Palestinian stories in the United States and abroad, and to improve the lives of Palestinians in Palestine and the diaspora. Today, we gather to honor the legacy of a remarkable individual, the late professor and scholar, Sharif Bassiouni, an Egyptian American and an emeritus professor of law at DePaul University in Chicago. Professor Bassiouni's influence spanned nearly five decades. He was renowned as the godfather of international criminal law and a war crimes expert. This year, we are delighted to be hosting Mr. Ahmed Abu Fool to deliver the Sharif Bassiouni Memorial Lecture. I will introduce Ahmed shortly. The topic of this year's lecture is not just timely, but of grave importance. As of yesterday, the Euromed Human Rights Monitor estimates that 24,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed by Israeli bombardment, and this number accounts for those presumed dead under the rubble. This number includes more than 9,000 children. And in addition to this number, more than 48,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been injured, and 1,840,000 have been displaced. A total of 53,000 homes have been completely destroyed and 172,000 units have been partially destroyed. Over 1,300 industrial facilities have also been destroyed. The numbers are staggering and the scale of killing and destruction is beyond comprehension. The 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide and the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court provide a legal framework for defining genocide. Today, as the war in the Gaza Strip continues, there are warnings from various groups, including Palestinian human rights organizations and Holocaust and genocide scholars about the grave risk of genocide against the Palestinian people. Today's lecture will examine the legal implications of Israel's military assault on the Gaza Strip since October 7th, situating it within the larger context of Israel's 75-year-long settler colonialism and apartheid imposed on the Palestinian people as a whole, including and mainly the refugees. It will shed light on the concurrent applicability of key legal frameworks, including those that define war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and will discuss the international community's responsibility to uphold international law and prevent further atrocities committed against the Palestinian people as a whole. About our speaker, it is my honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Ahmed Abu Fool, an international lawyer and legal research and advocacy officer at Al Haq Organization. Ahmed brings a wealth of expertise and personal experience to this discussion. He was born and raised in the Gaza Strip, 
and he has witnessed several of Israel's attacks and atrocities firsthand. In addition to his role at Al-Haq, Mr. Abu Fool is a research fellow at the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. He holds a master's degree in public international law from Leiden University and a Bachelor of Law, of law from Al-Azhar University in Gaza. This is the university where I also did my BA, a university that lays in ruins. Before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. After Ahmed provides the lecture, we will have a moderated Q&A session for those joining us via Facebook and YouTube. And for an upgrade, I think we're live on Twitter today. X. Please post your questions in the comments and we will convey them to our speaker. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Thank you for your attention and participation. And let's look forward to an enlightening discussion. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ahmed Abu Ful. Thank you very much for, for the kind uh, introduction, Jihad, and for the kind invitation. Um, when Jihad invited me, he said we would like to have you um, deliver a lecture at our center. Um, he did not mention it's the annual lecture uh, for Sharif Basuni, and I'm, I'm honored and humbled, humbled by, by this invitation, and I feel the responsibility, so I hope to live up to, to the expectation. Uh, I'm here in Washington for a few days now talking to Congress members uh, and to different stakeholders, including civil society, and um, it was surprising for me that there is a lack of knowledge about the context of the situation. Obviously, history did not start on the 7th of October. Um, and and I was really surprised that there seemed to be um, a lack of Palestinian voices talking to the American people. So you always hear about the Palestinians, but you don't hear from them. And what you hear about the Palestinians is exactly what Israel wants you to hear. So there is always this stereotype and racist tropes of Palestinians as irrational, uneducated, people you can't reach a compromise with. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate to say that I also sense that a lot of people are, uh, and 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 lawmakers also affected by that. And it was valuable for them to hear from uh, Palestinians. Um, I also learned today that uh, Israel has killed, uh, in addition to the ten members of my family that I lost, my cousin who is a paramedic. Ahmed Abu Fu, the same name, with the same name, along with with fifteen members of uh, of the family, uh, and all of these factors combined, uh, in a way, um, has encouraged me to decide instead of focusing only on the legal aspects to view the history and the context in which this is happening, uh, in order to understand why we reached that point, and whether describing the situation in Gaza and genocide is actually based on legal premise or is because of the um, horrific scenes that we see. It's notable to note when, when, when we say genocide, this is a legal term that is defined. This is a crime that has elements. And when the elements are met, the crime is there, regardless of the nationality of the perpetrator or uh, the nationality of, of those who are on the receiving end uh, of it. The same happens with apartheid. When we called it apartheid as Palestinians for decades, we weren't calling Israel names. This was an application of a legal term of a crime that has been committed, elements of crime that have been met. Uh, and it was unfortunate for some diplomats and some uh, um, policymakers would say, well, we can't use the A word. Again, it's not an A word. This is a legal term. This is a crime against humanity that Israel is committing. Same applies to, to genocide. Allow me at the, at the outset, at the beginning, just to, to, to provide few remarks. As, as the uh, UN Secretary General pointed out, this did not happen in a vacuum. This is, in fact, the result of 75 years of Zionist settler colonialism uh, in Palestine. It's also the result of 56 years of prolonged belligerent occupation. This is the longest occupation in modern history. Uh, 
the fact that an occupation was allowed to stay that long uh, in and by itself, in my view, uh, is a stain on, on humanity. Uh, this is also the result of 16 year long mil suffocating medieval like military blockade. Uh, on the Gaza Strip, where you have 2.3 million Palestinians live in around 360 square meters. It's one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Just to give you an idea how, how difficult the situation was already before this assault, before this offensive on, on Gaza, the UN published a report in 2012 expecting that Gaza will be unlivable by 2020. We're three years past that with indiscriminate, in the words of President Biden, who admitted yesterday that Israel is uh, indiscriminately uh, um, uh, bombarding Gaza, with the unprecedented indiscriminate bombardment of, uh, of civilians, uh, already the equivalent of more than uh, uh, two nuclear bombs like that thrown in Hiroshima. Uh, why I'm saying this and why I'm giving this context is for you to grasp the intensity and the gravity of the situation. This is like nothing we've witnessed before. And when I say we, I'm talking about uh, uh, lawyers and human rights defenders who have been working in this field for years. And on this particular situation, we've never seen anything like that. So when the Secretary General says that uh, what we're witnessing is an unparalleled amount of, of killing and destruction, it is true. This is something we haven't seen since World War II. Uh, and coupled with Israel's officials' dangerous genocidal statements, Israel's systematic targeting of civilians, mostly women and children, uh, notably 50% of the population in Gaza are children, uh, um, and that targeting of civilian objects, including uh, hospitals, ambulances, UNRWA schools where people are sheltering, uh, UNRWA food storages, um, uh, bakeries, and water reserves, indicates a deliberate policy of starvation that is being used as a method of warfare with the shamelessly announced intention to induce people to leave the Gaza Strip to Sinai, Egypt. Uh, uh, this is not analysis, nor is it speculation. This is an announced intention by the Israeli leaders. They say it openly. So it's quite shameful and disgraceful, to be honest, from the American administration to look the other side because they are complicit in this genocide. They have blood of Palestinian children uh, on their hands, admittedly. Uh, this is, in fact, another Nakba with frequent serious signals of a genocide unfolding before our eyes. And these are not only our words, these are, these are also the words and the analysis of our um, uh, Jewish colleagues, uh, including genocide and Holocaust scholars who uh, are saying this is a textbook case of genocide. So once again, the failure of some states to even call for a ceasefire, which is the bare minimum of human decency to do in such situation is not only shameful, it's actually scandalous. It's a disgrace. Uh, um, the situation is, is, is really uh, disastrous. I will, I will not talk further about the situation. Maybe I can come uh, um, uh, to that when we, talk, when we are in the uh, Q&A session. But maybe I will give you a few statistics that will explain how, how difficult the situation is. In the first month alone, the ratio of Israel's killing in Gaza was that Israel kills one Palestinian every four minutes. Israel killed four uh, women and six children every hour. In the first week alone, Israel bombed Gaza with more than the U.S. bombed Afghanistan in a whole year. In the first 25 days alone, Israel killed and injured more civilians than those killed and injured since the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. I leave it to you to compare the reaction of the American government between the situation in Ukraine and uh, uh, in Gaza. Um, so far, Israel killed in Gaza more than double the number of those killed in the Srebrenica uh, genocide of, um, of Bosnian Muslims. 
um, according to Save the Children, Israel killed in Gaza in the first uh, um, three weeks more children than those killed in all conflict areas around the world since 2019. So I hope this gives you an idea about how, how difficult the situation uh, is. And in order to explain, is this accidental? Was this something that emerged that Israel just became violent or became genocidal? Is genocide something that is completely unimaginable in the situation of Palestine? In this lecture, what I intend to do is to show you uh, that Israel's ideology, Zionism, is inherently genocidal. It's not the first time that we face this. As a matter of fact, 1948, the so-called Nakba was uh, an act of genocide. The only reason we didn't call it genocide, that the concept of genocide hasn't developed yet. We didn't have the genocide convention yet. Similarly, the racial uh, discrimination and the segregation regime here in the U.S. was also apartheid. The only reason we didn't call it apartheid, that we didn't have the concept yet. So the, the dominant uh, uh, narrative in relation to Palestine, you always hear, is 1967. They occupied Palestinian territory, which are, uh, as you see on the map, uh, roughly 22% of, uh, uh, of Palestine, of historical Palestine. So uh, um, can you imagine, if we want to properly address this situation, how, um, how long should we go back in time? Can anyone give a guess? We have to go back if we want to to address this situation. Uh, um, well, we'll come to this question later. I'll let you think about it. But the problem with this dominant narrative, the occupied Palestinian territory, um, uh, is that it automatically excludes two thirds of the Palestinian people and land from the equation. So we're not talking about two thirds of the Palestinians who are uh, refugees. It also suggests a confrontation between two equal parties, as there is power and responsibilities on both sides, this false symmetry of quote-unquote a conflict. Uh, also, it, it neglects to situate the occupation as, uh, as a symptom, actually, and a continuation of the overarching settler colonial and apartheid regime. It disconnects us from these legal framework and confine us to focus on uh, the occupied Palestinian territory and a legal form framework governing the occupation called international humanitarian law, which I will come to in a second. Uh, um, it also confines the, the, the thinking of a resolution in that of a conflict resolution, because we created this false symmetry of two parties to the conflict, uh, uh, rather than a process of decolonization which will address the root causes of the problem. And I will show in this presentation uh, how. So international humanitarian law is, is the body of law that governs uh, a situation of occupation, uh, which was never intended to stay that long. Situation of occupation was supposed to be temporary, a temporary administration until the occupation ends. Uh, uh, generally, IHL, international humanitarian law, does not actually outlaw occupation, it only governs it as a matter of fact. So it is also silent on the rights of determination. It is also silent on uh, the right to return, although it recognizes uh, uh, um, uh, people's right to resist that occupation. So to identify the, the legal frameworks uh, applicable to this situation, look at this chart. So far, we're confined with this legal framework, occupation. Legally speaking, all of these legal frameworks apply concurrently on the situation in Palestine. So now, in recent years, we started having the discussion about apartheid, which I will come to. But the larger context is settler colonialism, because apartheid is 
also a symptom of uh, settler colonialism. It's a, the by, byproduct of settler colonialism. And of course, this is all happening in a context of uh, imperialism and, and support to Israel regardless of its crimes. So how far should we go back? I will just go and answer this question. I think to properly understand the situation, we have to go back to 1897. And this is the first uh, um, uh, co Congress of the Zionist movement, which, uh, which is an Arabian uh, um, uh, ideology, uh, I would say a settler, colonial, racist, exceptionalist, and an expansionist uh, ideology, uh, which objective is to create for the Jewish people a home in Palestine secured by public law. So instead of challenging the unjust reality in Europe back then, the Zionist movement sought to create a nation state as the only solution uh, to escape European anti-Semitism. The prerequisite to, to uh, establish any state is first a uh, defined population, a territory, and a government. Guess what? None of that was there at that moment. So uh, in order to create the Jewish state, the Zionist movement uh, understood that it has to transfer Jews from different backgrounds into a homogenized national population. It has also to obtain from a colonial power, that is the Great Britain at that time, a territory to settle in. The decision was on Palestine. And it had also to create a proto-state institutions that facilitated and enabled this settler colonialism. And those are the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish National Fund, and the Jewish Agency. As a Palestinian prominent scholar puts it, colonization um, of Zionism was the instrument of nation building, not, not the byproduct of an already fulfilled nationalism. So you see colonization and colonialism is actually ingrained in the identity of the state and the ideology that established it. And we will come to how genocide is actually uh, also uh, ingrained in settler colonial ideologies. They, they are inherently uh, genocidal. So in 1917, we come to the powerful declaration which turned the Palestinians, who were over 97% of the population back then, into minorities. Look at the words. It says, nothing shall be done which may bridge the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities. So it turned 97% of the population into uh, a minority. I think this is one of perhaps the most flattering examples of, of colonial arrogance ignorance and disregard of a native population. Uh, under the British mandate uh, um, between uh, 1923 and 1948, uh, uh, the British facilitated the Zionist immigration to uh, Palestine and enabled those uh, uh, gangs that were at the time, by the way, labeled as terrorist organizations by British themselves. As a matter of fact, if you go through history, most of Israel's prime ministers, the, the, at the beginning bunch of them, they were all labeled as terrorists by the British government at the time. Uh, and then it was, the, Palestine was uh, decided to be a class A mandate, which means it was to be granted independence after the end of the mandate. But the Perfo Declaration was illegally incorporated in the preamble of the British mandate. And this was the first instance where the Zionists and Jews, as we said in the first Congress, secured by public law. Here, where the law intervened, that the Zionist uh, ideology and the Zionist movement found a legal justification for it by illegally incorporating the Palfa Declaration in the mandate. So I won't spend much talking about this time. I'm sure a lot of you can read uh, uh, this history, and there are a lot of people who wrote extensively about that, including, for example, the amazing work of Rashid Khalidi about the Hundred War um, uh, on Palestine against Palestine, and Ilan Babe about the ethnic cleansing of, of Palestine. So I hope you you read such work, and I will move faster now on on uh, uh, on this idea of the difference between colonialism and settler colonialism. So. 
What's the difference and which one applies to uh, uh, Zionism? Colonialism is usually dependent on the presence uh, and the subjugation of others, of the native. It doesn't want to eliminate them. It wants to enslave them, to use their resources and to exploit their free or uh, cheap labor and their natural resources, of course. Examples to that would be the British colonization of uh, India, the Dutch colonization of Indonesia, uh, uh, which were also uh, horrific and shameful legacies of this country. On the other hand, settler colonialism is centered on the notion of the land. It's not only about the resources. So it's it, in the eyes of a settler colonial ideology, the indigenous population obstruct settlers' access to land and to resources. And therefore, it's always described as settler colonial ideologies are premised on the elimination of the native because the native is a problem to the settler colonial project. So the logic of, of elimination is inherent in settler colonial ideologies, which is what you see now in Gaza. This is not something that happened in the 7th of October. This has always been there. And as I will show, the international community also recognized that. The United Nations also recognized that. So examples of, of such projects would be the country we're in right now, the US, which was only established after the genocide committed against the native population and the elimination of this uh, population. Uh, same applies to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and, and you name it. There seemed to be a trend in history. The settler colonial uh, uh, project usually managed to, to establish this project when they completely eliminate or near complete elimination of the native. And usually this happens in situations where the native don't have territory or contiguity with other nations and demographic support. So if you look at Australia, it's basically uh, an island. They had nowhere to go. Same in North America in general, you know, the US, Canada later, uh, um, uh, New Zealand and, and et cetera. But in other situations where there is territorial connectivity and demographic support, Settler colonial projects often fail, and these are described as the settler colonial enclaves in an indigenous land. An example to that would be South Africa, because it was connected to Namibia, Zimbabwe, and other countries. It, it failed to completely uh, erase the indigenous uh, population of South Africa. And when it fails, because settler colonial ideologies are inherently racist, it doesn't manage to merge with the indigenous and find coexistence. What it does, segregation and separation. And that's why you have, as a consequence of a failure uh, um, of settler colonial project, establishing an apartheid regime. And you see the, the, the trend, same happened in South Africa, same is happening in Palestine. So that's the evolution. We started with settler colonial project, tried to erase the Palestinians. It failed because the Palestinians are also connected to the bigger airport and they have the demographic support of it. And, and now they failed, established an apartheid regime, not only in our view as Palestinians, but our colleagues in international organizations, including the US-based uh, Human Rights Watch or the UK-based Amnesty. If you don't believe, if you don't want to believe your folks, maybe you should believe also Israelis. Different Israeli organizations said that this is an apartheid regime. So settler colonial uh, uh, ideology, settler colonialism is premised on the elimination of the native and it's, it's not a structure. It is a structure, but it's, it's not only an event. So it, if it fails, it doesn't stop there. It continues to try to eliminate the native population. And that is what we're seeing now because the Israelis have often described Gaza as quote unquote, demographic burden. So the Palestinians mere existence is a threat to the uh, Zionist ideology. And that's why when we Palestinians say existence is resistance, we mean it. We literally mean it because any expression of culture, any expression of, of, of life uh, um, is threatening to a settler colonial uh, uh, ideology. So the, the elimination is never simply about elimination, but it's about replacement. And that's why a trend in settler colonial ideologies would be the appropriation of the culture of the native. We see it, for example, with Israelis trying to steal, you know, cuisine, hummus, falafel, to dabka, to kufiya. Uh, um, and of course, it's, it's quite laughable for some people, and, and I understand that, but 
there's there's something much deeper in that. It's the ideology itself because it's about replacement. It's about eliminating the, the native and replacing them in their land. So I'll move on to 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 the first uh, attempt of ethnic cleansing or genocide of the Palestinian people, which happened in 1948. And I will the way I want to approach this to save time is just to quote some quotes just for you to measure those those, quote, those quotes against what we've been hearing from Israeli leaders today. Because when your representatives or when anyone tell, tells you, well, it's because they're hurt, they're mad, they're saying these things. Well, no, their leaders have always been, have always said this. So David Ben-Gurion, labeled as terrorist by uh, the British government, who was the chairman of the Jewish agency and later became the first uh, prime minister of Israel, once said, Zionists must expel Arabs and take their place. And if we, Zionists, have to use force, then we have force at our disposal. Of course, there's numerous uh, quotes from the founding fathers of, of, uh, of Zionism, whether Herzl, Chapuchinsky, and others clearly saying that their movement is a settler colonial movement, is an extension of the Western civilization, is quote-unquote civilization, if one can call it that, uh, to hold the Eastern uh, uh, um, uh, influence uh, on the West. So you see how they describe themselves as settler colonial ideology. It's not something we're, we're coming up with. They, they themselves describe the ideology as such. So then Nakba happened in 1948, which again, uh, arguably by many, it was an act of, of genocide that, 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 is, um, that has, fa has failed to completely conclude, uh, um, but managed to colonize the land. During the events of the Nakba, Israel destroyed over 530 Palestinian villages, including my home village, Hamama, which is close to, to Gaza. My family basically had to run for their lives by the Mediterranean coast until they reached Gaza. Uh, over 156 uh, um, homes were destroyed. Um, uh, around 80% of the Palestinian people became refugees and internally displaced. Now, in Gaza, 85% of the population is uh, displaced. I just, when I'm saying this, I keep referring to Gaza because I want you to keep it in mind. What is happening now is not an event. This is uh, uh, ingrained in the Zionist ideology. And I, I know you will see lots of similarities, rightly so, because it's the same project. It's the same ideology that we're dealing with. So the establishment of, of, of the state was basically the culmination of the Zionist settler colonial movement, but it wasn't its end because the project has not concluded. The Palestinians remain there between the river and the sea. So the Zionist movement decided to continue its project by creating a cohesive environment to induce people to leave. And now we go to another quote from a recent war criminal, Ariel Sharon, who was also accused by the genocide committed in Sabra and Shatila. This was decided by the UN too. This is the only reference to genocide in the Palestine history in the UN. Uh, so this uh, uh, genocidal war criminal said, you don't simply bundle people into trunks and drive them away. I prefer to advocate for a positive policy to create, in effect, a condition that in a positive way, will induce people to leave. Look now what's happening in Gaza. We don't want to displace the Palestinian people. We told them to leave the north, to the south. The south is safe. Then we bombed the south, right? Now they're bombing the south. They say, go further south, right? Uh, no uh, food, electricity, water, as Galen say, com complete uh, siege. Uh, we treat the, we, we're dealing with quote unquote human animals and we act accordingly. And then we're uh, witnessing starvation. And what do the Palestinians have left? What they're doing now is exactly that is creating a cohesive environment where you can't continue in the land. Once the door is open, you have to save your children. So you have to run. And that is exactly what, uh, what the Israeli government is doing at the moment is not different from what Sharon said long ago. 
So there, there, there are different tools for forcible transfer. I don't want you to be under the illusion that it's only what's happening now or the bombardment or a military campaign. Israel has been doing that through its colonial settlements enterprise in, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. That is uh, illegal under international law, uh, admittedly by the U.S. It's also illegal, but the U.S. continue to support it. There's no consequences whatsoever. Forced evictions of communities in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, exploitation of national resor natural resources, uh, heavy surveillance and uh, uh, military rule on the Palestinian people. Again, we said this is the longest occupation in modern history. Every aspect of our life is dominated by military rule. Literally, Palestinians uh, for over 50, 60 have been living under the boots of the occupation. The question should be why this occupation should continue. Not that history started on 7th of October. Not only this is naive and superficial, but it's also designed to derail the discussion from the real settler colonial project that is premised on the elimination of the Palestinian people as a whole. So the elimination of the native continues as a process of what we describe as Palestinians and ongoing Nakba. And this, what we're witnessing in Gaza, is another uh, step of it. And Israel has been em employing different tactics, including the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people, so the denial of right to, to, to return. Palestinians are divided to four categories. You have Palestinian citizens of Israel, 21% of, of the population that live as second-class citizens. And I will come to that in my presentation. You have Palestinian refugees the big part of the Palestinian uh, people who are outside the Palestinian geography. You have uh, Palestinians in East Jerusalem, which was illegally annexed, but they were not giving nationality. They were giving only permanent residency that could be revoked at any time. And they already revoked several, including human rights defender uh, um, uh, Salah Hamouri from ad -Damir. And guess what? They, they, they do revoke this uh, residency based on the so-called Pre, uh, a preach of allegiance. So as preposterous as this may sound, an occupying colonial power wants the occupied people to pledge allegiance to it. And the fourth category is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip who live under military rule, suffocating military rule, including the, the blockade in the Gaza Strip. But it also, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what the Zionist uh, um, Israeli state does is suppressing resistance and pre breaking the will of the people. So such violence is designed to break the Palestinians into submission. Like, can anyone tell us how should the Palestinians resist? Because literally, the Palestinians tried everything. They did the, uh, you know, Mandela and Gandhi style by marching to the borders in 2018, the so-called March of Return. They were all uh, shot. Uh, hundreds of Palestinian young men lost their limbs and the Israeli snipers were shooting them for sport. They actually, the, the Commission of Inquiry decided that. There were videos of them shooting, bitting on, on shooting uh, young men and, and celebrating that. And none of them was held accountable. None. So the Palestinians also tried, you know, to make quote-unquote peace. The Oslo Accord, the Palestinians only agreed on 22%. What was the Israeli reaction? Continue building settlements. Uh, um, now they portray that the problem is, is with Hamas. Well, Hamas emerged in 1987. The occupation started in 1967. There were 20 years before Hamas why there was no peace, why the occupation didn't end. There's no Hamas in the West Bank. Why the occupation did, didn't end. The representative of the Palestinian people, that is the PLO, that Israel signed the Oslo Accord with, remains also labeled as terrorist. When the Palestinians tried also the diplomatic track, we went. they went to uh, the International Criminal Court, for example, using the body of international law. Israel described it as pure anti-Semitism. When the Palestinians went to the court of the ward, the principal organ of the United Nations, International Court of Justice, the Israelis describe it as, you guessed it, diplomatic terror. Palestinian human rights organizations, like the one I'm Broadly affiliated with, that is al haq along uh, other five organizations, were labeled two years ago as terrorist organizations because of our legal legitimate work, which was 
actually rejected by by all the world. And to our surprise, there was actually a leaked CIA investigation that decided that these uh, allegations were unfounded and there was no reason for these designations. Yet, Despite that, the American administration did not pressure its best ally to allow the civil society uh, to work freely. Isn't civil society one of the most important pillars of any effective democracy? Well, the Americans should look at their ally and ask them to be more democratic. Zionism is racism. It's not only my words. This is the resolution of the United Nations in 1975, which concluded that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. It also, in, in different parts, referring, referring to other uh, uh, paragraphs, it described the, and I quote, unholy alliance between Zionism and apartheid South Africa. Notably, Israel was the only state that supported South Africa, including when it even condemned it in public, it offered the so-called Jericho missiles, nuclear heads, to the apartheid uh, in South Africa. These are historical facts. Please check and give back to me. So this resolution was revoked not because Israel stopped or Zionism stopped being racism or racial discrimination. No, no. Because Israel conditioned its revocation on coming to the Madrid Conference for Peace in 1991, which later would result in the Oslo negotiations and the Oslo Accords. So it was only revoked because Israel conditions revocation and coming to the negotiation table. A lot of people uh, miss this fact, and I think it's, it's important. And it's quite outrageous to hear that in this country, in this city, there's uh, a bill at Congress saying that uh, anti-Zionism is uh, uh, is anti-Semitism. It's quite outrageous. It's even offensive uh, uh, um, uh, to our Jewish brothers and sisters. It instrumentalizes the horror of the Holocaust, which will remain a stain on humanity, uh, in order to derail the discussion and prevent any criticism of Israel. It's a disgrace. Uh, it's a disgrace that this uh, resolution is being adopted. And, and perhaps I feel compelled to remind the American people, but also the American uh, legislators, that when the Palestinians were receiving Jews fleeing from Europe, were receiving them in Palestine or welcoming them, they were prohibited from entering the U.S. and the U.K. We should not forget this fact. Now... Reaching to apartheid, as we said, settler colonialism are inherently genocidal. When they fail, they impose an apartheid regime. And of course, uh, the Palestinians have been saying this for decades, but now it's becoming more extreme and you, you have different reports. I won't talk uh, a lot about them, but something important I think I have to mention that we have different reports on apartheid and they are uh, important. But personally, I think uh, what the Palestinian uh, perspective, which... I think representative, but it's represented by Al Haq report, which was endorsed by a number of organizations. I encourage you to read it. Uh, offers, uh, uh, we believe, um, uh, an analysis that is more consistent with the settler colonialism framework, and that is absent in other situations. Some of these reports, for example, in the whole report, the word colonialism and its derivatives would appear, for example, if I remember correctly, eight times, seven of which are in a footnote. And the eighth in the body of the report as part of a quote from an Israeli official. So you get the point. And of course, they will have to, to appear in footnotes because you can't talk about apartheid without talking about settler colonialism. It's the byproduct of settler colonialism. So if you're going to read something with all respect to the important reports of our colleagues, please read our report, which also engages critically with other reports uh, and their findings. So racism was inherent in the, in the ideology in, in Zionism and Zionist colonialists produced a racial segregation, uh, self-segregation and racial exclusive, uh, ex exclusiveness and racial supremacy as Faiz Sayer would put it in his important book, Zionist Colon Colonialism in Palestine of 1965. And why I'm saying this, because again, you hear about the Palestinians, you don't hear from them, because there's a specific picture of us. No, Palestinian intellectual production has always been there, and has always, in my view, has a clear moral compass that we need to listen to. We need to listen to what the Palestinians have to say 
from uh, the early days as well. I won't go. Uh, I won't talk much about apartheid since this is uh, not only about about apartheid. But please do read uh, our report uh, to understand uh, better Israel's apartheid uh, regime. But I will talk about briefly about uh, the fact that Israel's apartheid is premised in in two domains: uh, first, land, then nationality. And this makes sense for any settler colonial regime because it's about the land without the people. And you see the, the, the body of laws adopted is carefully crafted to allow the Israelis to obtain more land and to exclude more Palestinians out of it. So, for example, you have the law uh, of return and the law of citizenship of 1952. These are Israeli laws that allow any Jewish person around the world to return to the uh, Holy Land, become an Israeli citizen and live there, while Palestinians who were ethnically cleansed and displaced four years before that law was established are not allowed to return. And those who were who tried to return uh, uh, were actually uh, shot and killed. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know if I can announce that, but there's someone in the room who's actually writing something important about this. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to read. Uh, uh, Josh is actually writing uh, something about that that air. I hope soon to to read. Um, the same goes for 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 citizenship, uh, um, only for Israelis, not for Palestinians, and also a different body of laws that is uh, crafted carefully to ensure the continuation of the displacement and disposition, like the absentee property law. So not allowing people to come back, but then when they're not back, you say, well. The property is as uh, uh, there's no one to take the property, so the state can confiscate it because no one returned, which Israel did not allow to return. So y you get the legal framework there. So this is a map of of the different categories I just uh, mentioned and the strategic fragmentation that Israel is implementing in order to prevent Palestinians from never being able to meet, group, have any common life together and form any form of resistance to its uh, uh, apartheid regime. And these are the four categories I, I just mentioned. Uh, here, this is a very important point of, of, of history, I think, uh, which was, in my assessment, Israel shouting to the world, we're racist, we're an apartheid regime, we don't care, what are you going to do about it? The answer is nothing. Uh, uh, this moment was in 2018 when Israel adopted the so-called the basic law called the nation state of the Jewish people. This law uh, serves as a constitution because Israel does not have a constitution. So it's governed by basic laws. Uh, uh, and why Israel does not have a constitution? Because Israel can never tell you where it wants its territory. As I said, Zionism is an exceptionalist and expansionist ideology. It will never be able to draw the lines and tell you this is the territory I want. Because the Palestinians agreed already in 22%. I don't believe any country in the world made such historical compromise for a better future for their children and the Israeli children. But Israel will never tell you which territory it wants because it wants more with less Palestinians. So this law entails that the exercise of the right to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. This paragraph only, this sentence, automatically excluded 21% of the Israeli population that are Palestinians. So they have no right to self-determination. This is the definition of apartheid. So when anyone tells you Israel, quote unquote, is uh, the only democracy in the, in the Middle East, be respectful, be kind, and just ask them to read this law. Uh, uh, the, the law also in violation of international law entails that Jerusalem complete and united is the capital of Israel. It also says that the ethnic religious identity of the state is exclusively Jewish. Uh, it nullifies the former, uh, the former status of Arabic as an official language. Again, the language of 21% of, of, uh, of the population. Uh, um, it also says that the state views the development of Jewish settlements as a national value and shall act to encourage and promote its establishment and strengthening. So you have a country saying in its what would amount to a constitution saying a war crime is a national value. 
just imagine that. And the con and this country is is being sold to us, described to us as uh, it's actually self promoted, but also uh, self described, but also West promoted and American promoted as quote quote the only democracy in the Middle East. I think this is uh, the 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 fallacy of of the century. So this. Uh, um, uh, this triangle would show you, or this pyramid of, of Jewish supremacy would tell you how people live in different systems uh, uh, and how the strategic fragmentation uh, is being Im implemented. At the top of that, of course, Jewish nationals who have all, all the rights uh, uh, through the different categories until Palestinian refugees who are denied the right to return to their homes and villages from which they were ethnically cleansed. All right, I spoke a lot about apartheid, so we'll move now to the uh, um, uh, maybe maybe one of the uh, most important topics when, in relation to the situation in Palestine. That is accountability uh, um, in in Palestine, in Gaza, but in Palestine in general. I don't want you to to think I'm only talking about Gaza because since the beginning of 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 this assault in Gaza, we've been documenting at Al Haq a rise of. 133% of settler uh, attacks against Palestinians and pogroms being committed in, in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. So Israel is committing numerous war crimes. I can't even begin to list, but I encourage you to uh, read Article 8 of the Rome Statute, which lists all the crimes committed in international armed conflict. Because Israel is an occupying power, this is a situation of occupation. It's by virtue an armed, an international armed conflict. Uh, uh, and those crimes are the crimes that are committed as part of a plan or policy or part of a large scale commission of such crimes. I think this sentence uh, and definition is self-explanatory. Israel is also committing crimes against humanity as stipulated in Article 7 of the Rome Statute, uh, which are committed as part of a widespread systematic attack against, directed against any civilian population, in this case, the Palestinian civil, uh, civilian population, with the knowledge uh, of the attack. Um, of course, this includes persecution and apartheid that have been extensively documented. Genocide is also uh, a crime that is listed in the uh, uh, International Criminal Court Rome Statute, and it's uh, with the same uh, definition and underlying acts as the Genocide Conven Convention. And uh, that is the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, uh, rac racial, or religious group, and the underlying acts are killing members of the group causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions to life calculated to bring a, about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth uh, and forcibly transferring children. As you see, three out of five of the inter underlying acts are being committed uh, in Gaza at the moment. Usually if one is being committed, the crime of genocide legally is being committed and those responsible must be held accountable. And when I say those responsible, Article 25 of the Roman Statute answers the question. It's not only those who committed the, 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 the crimes or those who ordered uh, uh, the commission of the crime, but also those who aid and abet the uh, or otherwise assist in the commission uh, of such crimes. This includes those who send weapons to Israel and know that Israel is indiscriminately targeting the Palestinians, uh, one would imagine. So also, if you see on, on, on genocide, in particular, paragraph E, uh, um, in respect to the crime of genocide, directly and publicly incite others to commit genocide. I will speak about this incitement or uh, in relation to the in tend to commit genocide. So under the, the Genocide Com Convention, it's the same definition, the same underlying uh, acts. And, and, and one distinct feature of the crime of genocide uh, is not that it's complicated. It's actually, uh, in a, according to genocide scholars, it's perhaps one of the simplest crimes if you read it, if you read the definition and the underlying acts, the difficulty in proving genocide from an international criminal law perspective 
is that it requires a special intent. The intent that the person wanted to destroy in whole or in part uh, 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 that group. And of course, we're talking about a mental element of the crime. You can't get in someone's head and know what they intended. But just imagine, you know, if 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 Sharif Basuni was here, he would tell you that law, as any good professor of law would tell you, is not about memorizing the rules. It's about understanding them. It's it's logical. The law is premised in logic. So if I want to know what someone is thinking about, what is the best way to know it? It's what they're saying, right? It's their statements. That's why in this particular crime, the statements are usually the way that intent is being proved. That special intent, that higher higher threshold of proving intent is through statements. In certain situations, like in Rwanda, for example, um, uh, when the court found difficulty to prove the intent, they could uh, um, infer that intent was there from certain orders, for example, to rape women before, to see women before uh, killing them. And then you can understand the intent to destroy from such horrific acts. But the primary uh, uh, evidence of the commission of the crime or the primary indication of the intent to destroy is usually through statements. And as you know, we don't lack these statements in the situation uh, in Gaza at the moment from Netanyahu quoting the public story of Amalek, basically uh, saying kill their children, their women, everyone, even their, their animals, uh, or the Israeli defense minister saying we will impose a complete siege, no water, no electricity, no fuel, uh, we no food, we deal with human animals and we act accordingly uh, to the heads of, head, head of the state. As Haq Herzog, the president of Israel, saying uh, um, there is no innocent civilians in Gaza. Everyone is all of these numerous genocidal statements makes it clear that the intent to destroy in whole and in part is there. And this viewed with the context that I just explained, <clears throat> the context of Zionism as settler colonial ideology that is inherently genocidal. <clears throat> excuse me, is not surprising because we've seen it before, we've seen other statements and we're seeing it uh, uh, now. So, um, yeah, moving on to, to the responsibility for the crime of genocide. Similarly, it's not only the commission of genocide. Those who are responsible, as you see, uh, um, by Article uh, 2 of the, um, Article 3, sorry, of, of the uh, Genocide Convention, uh, those who commit genocide must be punished. Those who conspire to commit genocide also must be held accountable. Those who, uh, di uh, the, the direct and public incitement to commit genocide invokes the responsibility for it. And those who attempt to commit genocide, even if they failed. So genocide about intent is not about uh, as what people might think that genocide is the complete extermination of people. It is not. Sometimes you would have genocide even if you have one victim. If the intent is there to destroy and the act failed, the, the elements have been met. And those who uh, uh, tried, attempted to commit genocide must be held accountable. Uh, same also for the complicity in genocide. So those who know genocide is being committed and supported with weapons. And I will speak about that uh, uh, shortly. So uh, on the responsibility to prevent genocide, the Genocide Convention makes it clear that the contracting uh, parties um, un should undertake um, uh, to um, uh, enact in accordance with their respective constitutions the necessary legislations to give effect to the provisions of the present convention. What do I understand from that? That the convention is not only about your legal responsibilities internationally, but your national laws must be harmonized with this prohibition. So it must be recognized nationally. Genocide is prohibited in uh, uh, every country that is uh, a signatory to the Genocide Convention, and that is pretty much all the world, including the U.S. and including Israel.
if there is dispute between the parties, if someone is invoking the genocide convention by Article 9, so basically saying this country or that is committing uh, genocide, usually this dispute automatically goes to the International Court of Justice. So at this stage, any state could invoke the genocide convention uh, uh, against Israel, and it will be litigated at the International Court of Justice. And personally, I hope this happens uh, uh, soon because we're at critical time where we should not wait for genocide to happen against the again the 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 title of this convention is not only the punishment of genocide, the prevention. Too. We should not wait until genocide is completed and then uh, uh, prosecute those who, are, who commit it. We should prevent it uh, from happening. And, and numerous scholars, including genocide and Holocaust scholars, are saying what we are witnessing is a genocide unfolding before our eyes. Now, moving to our legal work here in the Netherlands, and in, in, sorry, uh, in, in the U.S., um, we are suing the American government. We're suing the American president, Biden, uh, the secretary of state, Blinken, and the secretary of defense, uh, um, Austin, uh, for their not only complicity, uh, but also failure to uh, prevent genocide. We're doing this with our partners, the Center for Constitutional Rights. And I recommend you to visit the website and read the case file. As you see, you will see uh, our notice of motion, you will see the, the whole uh, uh, case and the whole arguments, and also you will see declaration from several scholars uh, uh, on this particular topic, including the, the world's leading scholar in, in, in genocide in our lifetime, that is William Chappas, who also provided a declaration saying that apartheid is actually taking place, uh, sorry, genocide, there is serious risk of a genocide unfolding before our eyes and other respective uh, uh, scholars and, and professors. So please do read the complaint uh, um, and reach out if you have any questions. We hope uh, um, of a positive uh, outcome of this case. So now go back to, through this journey of the legal frameworks, I take you back to the same uh, thing we started with. Imagine if we keep the conversation about the occupied Palestinian territory, that is occupation there in this in in, in green, how uh, in in gray, how much are we missing? How uh, um, um, how lacking is anal our analysis uh, and our narrative about this situation? Uh, and in my view. Uh, looking at this, after this explanation of settler colonialism that is supported by imperialism, that is inherently genocidal and inherently implements apartheid, and then uses the framework of occupation to rationalize its apartheid. And if you ask me how, IHL, as we said, uh, uh, is a body to govern occupation temporarily. So by virtue, international humanitarian law provide for providing different treatment between the occupied population and the occupy the 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 occupying powers population but this wasn't intended to last forever and israel loves the occupation and international humanitarian law because it instrumentalizes it to impose an apartheid regime and if you say well you have different treatment israel would say well uh, it's international humanitarian law that that gives me that but what israel does is pick and choose so where where International humanitarian law can uh, rationalize its apartheid. It uses it and says we implement it. And when it's against a settler colonial uh, endeavors, like settlements, for example, they would say, well, those provisions are not applicable here. So you get the point. What is needed? What is needed is decolonizing Palestine, is a process of decolonization, is, is the importance to consider the settler colonial uh, uh, framework and uh, work towards a solution that aims to decolonize uh, Palestine rather than uh, saying uh, um, uh, we need peace and we continue the uh, structural injustices. Everyone deserves equal rights and a process of decolonization that actually revisits the horror of the past uh, and addresses the crimes committed against the Palestinians. So before rebuilding a so-called political project, we need to identify the situation as it is, settler colonialism, apartheid, and occupation. Without a decolonization process, even creating a state 
one or two or three, whatever solution we come with, would not ensure the righteous of determination and can regenerate injustices uh, uh, and uh, the uh, erasure of the Palestinian people. I mean, we've, we've seen this with the Oslo Accords. Where did it take us? Uh, uh, more oppression, more uh, settlements, more colonization of the land, and now we're facing a genocide in, in Gaza. Therefore, the focus should not be on the structure of our future, but on the substance that would ensure self-determination and liberation for all people. Uh, dismantling the Zionist settler colonial apartheid regime and its discriminatory laws, policies, and practices of forcible transfer, property appropriation, disposition, and domination, and allowing for the right to return of refugees as a key pre prerequisite uh, for the substance of our self-determination liberation. Uh, I know a lot of people want me to talk about... Uh, um, about the ICC a bit more. So what I would say is 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 the following. Uh, we believe, just to, to conclude my remarks, I, I think I went a little bit over time, which is always uh, the case with lawyers. I think they just like to speak about topics they believe they understand. We believe from our perspective as, as a human rights organization that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in brief, uh, um, can move forward and start issuing arrest warrants now. We believe uh, that he has enough uh, uh, um, information needed to start cases, and there is no reason for further delay. While, from a legal perspective, while one can understand that certain crimes require access to the territory, which is a justification that is often often used, uh, um, you know, access to obtain hard evidence and to be able to build a case. Uh, the court has demonstrated in the past that it doesn't necessarily need access to start cases. In Sudan, for example, it started uh, cases and, and uh, issued arrest warrants before having access to the territory. In addition, certain crimes uh, in the situation in Palestine uh, does not necessarily need access to the territory to be investigated. And they, the, 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 the most obvious example of that would be settlements. All you need, satellite imagery showing you the green line and where Israel colonized land. And if you need the, you know, the, um, the mental element of the crime or the intention to colonize the land, Israel is not even hiding it. They, they sign on legislations to, to legalize these settlements. So everything needed to prove this crime is available in the public domain. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we believe this is one of the most settled crimes in international law since the 1945 Nuremberg trials, which was, uh, which is considered the origins of international criminal law. Uh, but also, in fact, there is even political consensus around the world that this is in violation of international humanitarian law, and this is a war crime, including the U.S. In 2016, there was a Security Council resolution that the U.S. did not veto uh, that entails that settlement, Israel's uh, um, illegal colonial settlements and enterprise is uh, um, uh, illegal. So we call on the prosecutor and we hope that he expedite and conclude aspects of, of the investigation in the situation in Palestine and start issuing arrest warrants. This is long overdue and there are no justifications uh, whatsoever as to why this uh, should take any longer. We believe justice delayed is indeed uh, justice denied. Uh, finally, I leave you with what, what we can do, and I know this is often a question that we're uh, being asked, but there is so much we can do, even on the individual level, and we can start by raising awareness about the situation in Palestine as that of settler colonialism, apartheid, and occupation, not only uh, occupation, as we've shown, raise awareness about the situation in Gaza, and that Israel is in fact committing uh, genocide uh, in Gaza. That is what the law says, and we should all abide by the law. We should also adopt uh, the language of the settler colonialism and apartheid legal frameworks in our speech. Uh, and I'm not talking only on an individual level, but this is a message you could convey to your representatives, uh, your Congress representatives, to include such legal frameworks in their statements, resolutions, and any relevant documents or letters about Palestine. And also demand your representatives to do the bare minimum human de decency require us is to call for a ceasefire, to stop the bloodshed. There's nothing, nothing in the world justifies uh, what's happening in Gaza now and the, the crimes that Israel is committing. Demand your representatives to recognize that Israel has established an apartheid regime 
over the Palestinian people. They can't keep uh, looking away. Until we recognize reality, we can seriously claim uh, that we can address it properly. Push uh, uh, and demand your representatives to adopt uh, or propose legislations prohibiting sending weapons to Israel because this is complicity in war crimes, crime against, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Also demand that your representatives to adopt legislations to prohibit importing, importing uh, Israeli illegal settlements, goods, and services because these are made uh, at the expense of the Palestinian people, at, at, at the expense of the colonization of the Palestinian land and the appropriation of their natural resources. Also call on your governments to, to cooperate with all relevant actors to end uh, the unlawful situation and to stop the unfolding uh, genocide uh, in Gaza. I, I think I went a little bit over time, so... I will conclude here. I will stop here and I look forward to the discussion and to uh, your questions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. I know that you have to uh, run soon and um, I I wrote down some questions for you. Uh, but I know that I can call you at any time and ask you these questions. But uh, I would like to open the floor for our audience here. Um, I know uh, they have, I'm sure they have a lot of questions for you. But um, thank you so much for this great lecture. And uh, we appreciate, uh, you know, the, the time and the, the energy that you put into this uh, presentation. So thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, Okay, so if you have any questions, just you know, introduce yourself briefly and uh, pose your question, and and then we'll take it from there. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation so far. At least the part I came late, so the part I heard of it, and um, but uh, may read uh, Maguire has suggested taking the question to the uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, can Israel really be uh, pursued on this? And what's the best way of reaching it? Or should there be a special uh, court maybe uh, established? Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, the, the, the question to that, that we need and, and a court ruling to decide that there is apartheid is often used um, by by diplomats and policymakers in, in Europe or in the US. Uh, and I think legally, of course, there's always this possibility to go, to go to the International Court of Justice. Any state could ask this question. The General Assembly could ask for an advisor opinion. Um, any state, if it wishes, it can ask this question. But uh, do we actually need a court ruling necessarily to recognize this apartheid. As a matter of fact, the International Court of Justice itself answers this question in its ruling on the continuing illegal presence of the uh, apartheid South Africa in Namibia. The court, the court said that the fact that there is an apartheid uh, uh, imposed in South Africa was a matter of public record. If it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. If it looks like apartheid, it is apartheid. As I said, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you were here from the beginning, but uh, Israel's nation uh, state uh, law of 2018 uh, doesn't need a court to, to, to tell us that it is apartheid. It is apartheid. We see it. I mean, a country that denies 21% of its population uh, um, their, their rights of determination, a country that in, have two-tiered system. Uh, for one part of the population and others under its control that is colonizing that are the Palestinian people, including refugees that are also denied their right to return. Because what is apartheid? It's, it's, it's a system of institutionalized racial discrimination where one group has the rights, the other is denied uh, the rights. So it's important also to know this is another question that apartheid doesn't have a territorial scope. It's not about in which part it's being uh, committed. It's against whom 
regardless of where they reside. So apartheid is also imposed on the Palestinian refugees that are denied the right to, to return. So to answer your question, yes, absolutely. Any any state can take this uh, question to, to the court. Uh, but personally, I don't think we need a court ruling to know there is apartheid and history has shown us that we don't need that. It wasn't the case in, in apartheid South Africa. How about on the issue of genocide? Concerning yeah. Concerning Gaza and... Uh... Uh, you know, uh, the United Nations, Israel is an occupying power. So does it have the, the right to defend itself as we are often hearing? Thank you. No, thank you for this question. Well, in order to answer this question, but, but let me, I will come to the right to self-defense later, which I think it's, it's quite uh, interesting that people keep repeating that. Uh, but on, on apartheid or genocide, the difference is, uh, genocide is a convention that almost ratified by, by the whole world. Apartheid is not. If you look at apartheid, as a matter of fact, the U.S. is not a party. Most European states are not a party. Why? You may wonder. There's a historical justification. I wouldn't say justification, but reason for that. Uh, that apartheid was referring to settler colonialism, and these countries have a shameful history of colonialism and settler colonialism. And that mention wasn't really preferred. This is one of the theories why they still refuse to, to join the apartheid convention. So there's a different framework there. But in within the, the genocide convention, there's consensus. Everybody agrees on that. And in accordance with Article 9, as we've shown, any country can take Israel to court uh, uh, um, and ask about Israel's implementation of, of the convention. And uh, I said it actually in, in the lecture. I think it's, it's essential and it's important and it should happen. Uh, states should start taking Israel uh, to court. We've seen it invoked in other situations, for example, in uh, um, by Gambia and the uh, Myanmar and in other situations. So it's it's possible. It happened before and it should happen uh, now. This is uh, this is essential on the right to self defense. Uh, I wish I could say is the million dollar question. Is just the question that I I I had answered so much that I yeah I don't know. Uh, well. In order to answer the, this question, we need to identify the legal framework that regulates uh, uh, the rights of determination. Uh, sorry, rights of defense, excuse me. Rights of defense is uh, regulated in Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. And this right is entailed for states against an attack from another state, not a non-state actor. So even, even further, if there is any doubt that maybe states also have this right against non-state actors, definitely they don't have this states until uh, un uh, against the people they occupy. Because by virtue, we just said, if you're a Sunni here, would tell you the law is logical. So the law cannot say the people have the right to to uh, self determination, have the right to resist. But in the same time, which the occupying power have the right to just defend itself? No, because the occupying power naturally has positioned itself as the aggressor. It can't invoke the rights of defense. And as a matter of fact, the International Court of Justice has answered this question in 2004. Because as preposterous as it may sound, Israel also argued self-defense for building the wall. We build the wall in, in, in self-defense. And when the court addressed the question, the court was clear that the, the, the rights of defense for states under Article 51 cannot be invoked uh, against the people that uh, a country is occupying. And the exact words of the court were that the rights of defense uh, under Article 51 is irrelevant to the occupied Palestinian territories. So anytime we're talking about the occupied Palestinian territories, as long as they are occupied, there is no uh, um, justification for invoking the rights of defense. Legally, it's irrelevant. And so what's the, what is your, apart from the obvious of like, why, um, why these states, like maybe even some of the Arab countries who met in Saudi Arabia with Islamic countries and yet, and they still have ties or diplomatic ties with Israel and yet they still haven't taken any steps towards this, um, like taking Israel to court with the ICJ. So what is your, in your opinion, like causing this whole delay f from it actually getting started? Yeah, that, that... <laughs> That is a good question that I can never answer from a legal perspective, which is my area of expertise. But I, what I can say, I think it's it's politics. Now, the law allows for something. Whether states take that path or not, it's political will. 
it depends on on, on political considerations of each uh, state but I, I I think uh, uh, it could be that this is being considered but some states perhaps are under the illusion that diplomacy might work but what we've been seeing recently that Israel is shouting to the world we won't comply we don't care we'll continue to commit crimes to the extent that even Biden, someone who lied before about seeing 40 babies in the White White House walked it back, even Biden saying Israel is indiscriminately bombing the Palestinians. So we might be like moving towards that point where, let's say, the policymakers of the world, the leaders of the world are coming to the realization that there is no way for policy for diplomacy to work and Israel is not interested in any peaceful resolution. And therefore, it might be the next step for, for lots of states to invoke the Genocide Convention. Personally, I hope so, uh, because further delay will mean more uh, um, uh, children and civilians killed. Oh, are you going to ask? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, what do you see are the pathways for dismantling of the, the Zionist uh, project? And of the possibilities, what do you think is the most likely? To work yeah um as 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 i explained it seems throughout history reading throughout history that we're closer to the south african experience and historically and i think lamb babeja spoke about this i think a few days ago when he was asked, uh, asked about similar question uh, he mentioned and he's quite right about it that uh, settler colonial regimes at their final phase when they're about to fail they get really violent uh, uh, and it seems that it has to get really bad before getting uh, better. But my, my, I'm, I'm very skeptical of of, uh, of this idea because I'm, I think we shouldn't be uh, under the illusion that this factor alone will bring about its end. Uh, because you have to remember, in in the apartheid, in the South African apartheid, it reached a point politically where it was not important for the U.S. So it was that moment that started going down. Israel is still important for the U.S. So it's still, uh, uh, you know, politics still play. And and to what extent the situation will go until the U.S. realizes that Israel is not only uh, um, uh, damaging to the reputation of the U.S., but also to the whole body of international law that the U.S. wanted to or claimed to, to promote and is very damaging this partnership rather than uh, uh, benefiting uh, the Americans. So uh, perhaps until we reach that point where the partnership with the U.S. is is more damaging than beneficial to the Americans, that we will uh, start seeing this. Because we, without the American support, the whole project will, will collapse because it's premised on the Western support in general, whether in, in Europe or the U.S., in all honesty. Thank you for the presentation. And I uh, I saw Sharif Basiuni speak here for the first time. And I, I based on his presentation, I think he would be very proud if he was able to see your presentation. So you lived up to expectations and you honored honored his legacy. Um, my question is about violent resistance and not, not in the like usual way that's talked about in the US. I'm trying to ask a difficult question. Or, um, but it's not the typical question about violent resistance, is that how does the existence of a viable violent resistance in your maybe speculation, how would it change the sort of availability of legal recourse? Like what I'm trying to ask is, does the existence of an actually viable violent resistance open up other venues of possibility like legal recourse, which is not as available when a party has no leverage? as a people. So I'm, I'm, maybe I'm asking you to kind of speculate if that's a factor here, if, you know, like with the, with Madrid, it comes after the Intifada. So it's only, you can only start to have peaceful negotiations. You can only have that after there's some threat of violence, unfortunately, from a realist perspective. So I'm just curious if you think about that relationship at all. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And, and I think to start with, I feel compelled to say the Palestinians have the right to resist the occupation in every mean possible that and what they decide to choose is up to the palestinians the official pal the official position of the palestinians is not uh, not armed resistance is actually um, negotiations which failed it's actually diplomacy which always being the, the described as terrorism right uh, but if the palestinians decide which they did before right 
um, to use armed resistance, it must be compliance with compliant with international law and in accordance with the rules of international humanitarian law. Therefore, civilians can never be uh, targeted. So, for example, if we talk about specific scene where resistance members uh, um, attacking an Israeli soldier, or, or as we see, an Israeli tank and dragging a soldier, taking them out, I can never say that this is illegal. The, the law permit that. The law permit that. The, the people have the right to resist their occupier, but no one has any right to attack uh, civilians or children or women. No no sane person would, would agree on this. But of course, in this particular situation, no one can also uh, uh, allege that we we can trust Israel to investigate that. Israel has a history of pathologically lying. There has to be an independent international investigation to decide who committed what and hold those responsible uh, to account. Now, historically, Liberation movements, uh, some of them start violent, but then dis decide the uh, uh, the diplomatic path or the, the peaceful or the popular resistance style. Nelson Mandela, South Africa itself, started as violent. A lot of people don't know. Nelson Mandela started his resistance to the apartheid regime violently. And then, uh, I don't want to say matured, but evolved into adopting this, this model. The same happened with the PLO. PLO was violent, but then adopted uh, the more, uh, um, I would say, even the political slash diplomatic path recently. Uh, and of course, the, this can be viewed as, as an evolution of any liberation movement. But what is important, I have to say, is not which path the Palestinians uh, are taking. It's that regardless of what they decide, which is only for the Palestinians to decide, it has to be, it has to be within a political project, a clear political project knowing where the Palestinians are going. And uh, it's it's beyond my, I wouldn't say my expertise, but beyond, beyond the topic of, of today that I speak about politics and I don't engage in it. I, I focus on my, my field, which is uh, law. Uh, I think uh, the Palestinians need to answer a lot of difficult questions in terms of what is what is it that, that they want and hey, how they want to, to achieve it. And I think nobody can be under the illusion that we don't have a serious crisis in leadership. There need to be more youth uh, and Palestinian leadership, and there is a younger generation that is uh, well articulated to express themselves. And uh, in order to do that, we need a political process. We need elections with which Israel has been preventing. And unfortunately, uh, the U.S. is not pressuring its only democracy in the Middle East, uh, quote unquote, partner to allow elections, to allow us to have democracy and choose our representative. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you all for your one great and uh, important questions. Um, with this, we conclude our event for today. Uh, I encourage you all to follow Ahmed's uh, social media accounts and follow his work and follow the work of Al Haq. And uh, and also, while you do that, follow our work too and uh, stay tuned for future events and programs here at the Jerusalem Fund. This, uh, this was our first in-person event since the beginning of the genocide in Gaza, and we're honored to have you here. And hopefully this knowledge and this perspective can help uh, push all of us to uh, work harder and harder uh, on uh, challenging the, these can atrocities. Can I say final thing? I'm, I'm, I'm also proud that I'm invited by, by the center, of course, but... but uh... Uh, with uh, with someone that we're really proud of who's also from Gaza. So you have examples of what Gaza has to offer. Uh, so I hope uh, many of, of those in Gaza who are perhaps hopeless at the moment look up to this and know that they have something in this world and they need to fight for it. Thank you. And I hope your family is safe and, uh, and we pray to our people there. And uh, thank you all for coming.